Okay, um, it's 10.30 on the dot. Uh, welcome to the second day of the Coleridge's in Transition Virtual Week that is organized by the Secretariat of the Platform for Coleridge in Transition. My name is Andrzej Błachowicz, and I am one of the senior advisors at the Platform Secretariat. Um, so the purpose of this meeting today, there are three goals of the meeting today. The first one is to look and discuss the clean energy potential of coverages in transition. And specifically on their path to something that we call a renewable energy production hubs. This is where we want coal regions to, to go in that green transformation. Very important and very timely process. In more concrete terms, we want to introduce two studies to you. One is a white paper produced by Bloomberg New Energy Finance to be released on, on Monday. So for those of you uh, who um, are st have, still, have still appetite for more interesting events after this week is over, uh, we, we will invite you to this, to, to the Bloomberg event. And that white paper is about how to invest in recovering transition in Europe's coal regions. The second study to be presented is a study by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, and that is a policy report assessing the clean energy potential of EU coal regions. The third element of our meeting will be the panel discussion with policy makers and industry leaders. As you see, we have 90 minutes and quite a full, diverse and interesting agendas. And here are some practicalities and housekeeping rules. So uh, only the presenters uh, are visible and can speak. Uh, so all participants uh, are muted at all times. The meeting is recorded uh, and will be available online afterwards on the DG Energy YouTube channel. So you simply type in DG Energy and you see uh, previous events and, and this one will be also posted there. Uh, point two is we encourage you to ask questions, but please only use the Q&A tool uh, in the uh, teleconference system and please do select to all panelists this is important you have various options there in a little box please select to all part, uh, all panelists questions are visible only to panelists and there are three things that happen can happen to your questions some of them will be asked and answered during this uh, meeting some will be answered uh, by in writing during the meeting but we will record all the questions and they will be used for further work of the uh, Secretariat uh, for the Platform for Coal Regions. So please be assured that no question will be wasted. Uh, hope that can act as encouragement. The chat, there is also a chat box. Please don't use it except for cases when you have a technical issue with connections, stuff like that. And our team uh, will, will deal with that and will try to to make sure you can be properly connected and participate. Okay, so let me now run us through the agenda. So we will start with those two presentations uh, as uh, already outlined. So hopefully uh, we can be done with this by 11 o'clock. Then we thought we should give you uh, a small breather and we will pose three questions to you in a bit of an online survey just to test uh, the feeling and test what people think about uh, clean energy transition. And then around quarter past 11, we will move to the panel, to the policy industry talk on the green recovery. Uh, we'll have four panelists there, uh, and hopefully we can engage as many of you uh, as possible via the, 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 the Q and A's that you can, uh, the questions you can post, and then we try to to, to, to direct those questions to panelists. And hopefully we can have a nice debate uh, as nice as it is possible in a, in a virtual environment. Right, I'm just looking at my little guide here. Yeah, you might be, uh, you see that probably, but we have around uh, 170 participants plus 15 organizers. So a little bit below 200 people on this call. Uh, great to have you there. 
and thanks for for finding time for us because the competition for uh, attention in this time of online events is is huge okay i think we can now move to the the first speaker and the first speaker is uh, Catherine Poseidon, who is a senior policy analyst in Bloomberg New Energy Finance Energy Transition Team. She manages their research on coal phase out and energy transition, especially, especially in Eastern and emerging Europe. And prior to that, Catherine was uh, based in Athens, working for a Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy. And as already mentioned, her presentation will be about investing in the recovery and transition of Europe's coal regions. Very timely topic. Catherine, over to you. Thank you very much, Andre, and um, good morning to everyone from London. Thank you for having me here today. Um, again, my name is Catherine Poseidon. I'm an analyst at Bloomberg NEF. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be back at the platform, even virtually, to kick off today's session. I will aim to set up um, this discussion on the renewables potential of coal regions with some data points from BNEF on power sector drivers. And then I'll also share some of the highlights of this modeling work um, that we've recently prepared that looks at least cost transition pathways for several coal countries. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, before I begin, just let me quickly say a few words about BNEF. We are an independent research house with a team of 250 experts across uh, six continents. And we work within the broader Bloomberg research team, which is also distributed across the world. Next slide, please. And we provide research on the energy transformation. So everything from larger renewable sectors like wind and solar to off-grid demand response uh, storage, electric vehicles, as well as commodities, uh, digital industry, and advanced materials. So we try and take a, a really holistic look at essentially everything that will impact the energy transition. Next slide, please. So as I said, I'll, I'll start with looking at the drivers very briefly, the energy transition, which are creating opportunities for coal regions. And we believe will continue to do so or even accelerate over the next decade. So to begin with, um, I think it's, it's clear to everyone in this audience that more ambitious European targets combined with the really unprecedented support for just transition that's been discussed throughout this week can propel Europe's coal region than we may have thought possible. It's also clear though that if these targets are to be achieved, there will need to be a very rapid shift in the rhythm of the energy transition that we've seen so far. So to achieve a 55% reduction in emissions by 2030 um, from 1990 levels, some 1.8 gigatons of, of CO2 equivalent will need to be cut. This is roughly equivalent to the annual emissions from the entire German economy. So at BNF, we think that the power sector is really likely to be the cornerstone, reflecting the availability of competitive generation technologies um, that can be scaled, plus the opportunity for electrification in other sectors. At the EU level, we expect that higher targets and the green recovery plan, um, including the availability of much higher volume of just transition funding than was initially laid out, um, will be able to accelerate the transition over the next decade, adding to other policy and economic drivers that are already changing the power mix. I mean, for an example, just in the last several days, we're seeing coal closures in response to the end of IED derogations as economic pressure on coal generation cast doubt on the viability of the investment that would be required for retrofitting and upgrading. Uh, next slide, please. So over the last several months, COVID-19 has, has compounded the economic pressure that the coal industry has been feeling across Europe. Um, lower power demand due to lockdown. In some countries, demand has fallen as much as 21% from business as usual during the peak lockdown period. And this has seen coal generation squeezed out of the mix to some extent. Um, the reasons why coal generation has found it more difficult to compete are, are several. First, uh, low gas prices have um, accentuated coal's vulnerability as cheap gas is powering coal to gas fuel switching. But at the same time, domestic coal production has been facing a long-term decline. In, in all of these charts um, shown here, coal and or lignite generation is down 
dramatically in the first five months of 2020 compared to 2019. But I also wanted to include 2018 um, to indicate that this is an acceleration of an existing trend, not a new development um, or an anomaly that is likely to be reversed. And perhaps the most significant reason for, for this is the exposure of fossil fuels to the carbon price. Coal generation has already fallen over the last two years um, as rising carbon prices have put pressure on operating margins for coal plants. And at BNF, we expect the price to continue to grow over the next several years, uh, even with COVID-19. And then beyond 2024, it, it is likely that reform to the ETS will keep prices elevated. Um, which will maintain pressure on coal assets. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, uh, competition from zero marginal cost renewables is also squeezing coal. But at the same time, this is where we see the opportunities for both an acceleration of the energy transition, but also a source of growth. So Bloomberg NEF tracks the levelized cost of electricity from renewable sources over time. And in the first half of 2020, we have reached a point where the cheapest option on an LCOE basis for new baseload generation is either wind or solar in most parts of the world. These cost trends are encouraging in the context of this platform because they do not only apply to mature renewables markets. One of the biggest reasons for this downward shift over time is equipment costs. So wind turbines, the price has fallen 40% since 2014, and um, while they are now able to extract 20% more energy from the same location, while crystalline PV modules are now almost 70% cheaper than they were five years ago, while the cost of inverters is down 54%. So these cost improvements can really be applied across the board, including in countries with less mature renewables markets. So at BNF, we undertook a project to use these cost inputs um, in parallel with our proprietary modeling tools to come up with a least cost outlook for the power sector in several countries that will have a, a steeper pathway to decarbonization. Um, we also wanted to focus on countries where the discussion on moving past coal generation is still in its earlier stages or yet to be developed in hopes that um, our analysis may be a useful tool for national governments and regions and also for utilities who are looking for the opportunities that energy transition may bring. Um, so I'd like to just very briefly share some of the highlights of this work. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, we focused on countries that do not yet have a coal phase out plan in place, but, but still rely heavily on the fuel. So we zeroed in on Poland, Czechia, Romania, and Bulgaria whose capacity mixes in 2018 are shown on this slide. Um, just in the interest of time, I, I won't go into detail on our modeling methodology now, except to say that we use a policy agnostic least cost approach to look at what is technically and financially feasible in the power sector over the next decade for each of the countries in question, in question without looking at aspirational targets, but really only taking into account the short-term pipeline of projects that are already under development, and then from there, what makes sense on a least cost basis. Next slide, please. So in that least cost pathway, we see among these four countries, just over 50 gigawatts of new renewables installed over the next decade. Um, the split is fairly even between wind and solar, with more PV generation in Romania and Bulgaria, where PV can achieve higher capacity factors, and wind on a cost basis dominates in Poland and Czechia. We also see several gigawatts of offshore wind installed in Poland, while on the flip side, the least cost pathway for these power systems sees around 27 gigawatts of coal capacity retiring by 2030. It's around half of the current operational fleet for those four countries together. So to reiterate again, this is a policy agnostic scenario that doesn't take into account, for example, likely reforms to the EU ETS, um, which we would expect will increase pressure on coal in the second half of the decade and likely even accelerate this decommissioning pipeline. Next slide, please. So the renewables bill that's outlined in this least cost scenario brings almost 50 billion euros in new investment to the renewable sector across Poland, Czechia, Romania, and Bulgaria. 
the largest share of investment goes to onshore wind, which has higher CapEx costs than utility scale PV. And we also see considerable investment for offshore wind again in Poland. So this new capacity can bring a, a stable inflow of capital and also generate sustainable growth and foster the development of a new sector in addition to bringing clean electricity. Next slide, please. The, the impact of this investment is a meaningful reduction in emissions over the next decade. So in the least cost scenario, the total emissions in 2030 for those four countries combined are around half of the levels um, that we saw in 2018. So renewables additions on top of the pretty ample hydro and nuclear resources um, that the region already has mean that together these countries can reach a share of 62% zero carbon generation by 2030. So these results show us that, that coal regions can play a much greater role in Europe's energy transition than we might have expected when the power sector is optimized on a least cost basis. Um, next slide, please. So the full analysis um, hasn't yet been published, but it will be launched this coming Monday. If you're interested in joining us, uh, please do. During that presentation, I will share the country level breakdown um, of all of these charts that you've seen, as well as more, looking at the least cost pathway for the next decade. And then we also compared these with the capacity mix that each country indicates in its NECP um, with the conclusion that by adopting a realistic target for 2030, um, this really makes sense, but, but the definition of what is realistic is a lot more ambitious than, than what we've seen so far. So hopefully the momentum generated behind um, the green recovery package and the support that's available through the just transition mechanism can help accelerate a step change towards a more sustainable and just future. And from our perspective, that is the most reasonable choice on an economics basis, even if we're not taking into account climate targets. Um, so that is just a very brief summary. I apologize for going through it so quickly, um, but happy to answer questions and I look forward to uh, the ongoing discussion for the rest of the day. Thanks very much, uh, Kathleen. Uh, very fascinating. I propose that we move on to, to the second presentation because, yeah, we will we will have that, uh, and you will be later on in, on the panel as well. Uh, the second study is very complementary uh, to the, the, the Bloomberg uh, white paper. It goes much more into details, and it has also country presentations. Uh, so. Uh, the, the study will be presented by two speakers. The first one is Zoe Kapetaki, who is the project officer at DG Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Zoe has been involved uh, with the Coal Regis in Transition platform since its inception, so late 2017, and her work at JRC focuses on impact of transition on the regions beyond coal, as well as opportunities in the clean energy sector. Prior to that, she did variety of projects on energy in Europe and South America. The second presenter from JRC is Pablo Ruiz, also a project officer there. His uh, engagement at JRC is much more on the modeling side. He has developed and released a number of tools that relate to energy system, renewable energy potentials, and also assessing the employment impacts uh, resulting from development of renewable energy technologies. They will jointly present the study uh, that was published this year on European coalition transition. The study was prepared prior to the COVID-19 epidemic. So I also asked uh, both of them to uh, say a word about the relevance of um, the study in the current situation. I mean, intuitively you can say it's even more relevant, but I just wanted you to address that as well. Uh, Zoe, Pablo, I don't know what is the, the order, please over to you. Thank you very much, Andre. Good morning uh, from my side, uh, here from the Netherlands. Uh, I'm Zoe Kapetaki. I'm coordinating the work on regions in transition at the Joint Research Center, um, Knowledge for the Energy Union um, Unit. And together with my colleague, Pablo Ruiz, we will present uh, some major findings from, uh, from our uh, work uh, on, on the regions in transition. Next slide, please. So as Andre already mentioned that uh, the Joint Research Center, we have provided, we have supported the coal regions in transition since 2017, pretty much since its uh, very beginning. 
at first by identifying the, the coal uh, regions in Europe that could face challenges uh, in their transition beyond coal. Uh, moving on to estimating uh, the potential and what are the uh, available options for, for these regions and analyzing uh, the implications of this uh, on employment. Next slide, please. So the tangible outputs uh, of our work uh, have been two reports. The one was published in 2018, the one you see on your left-hand side, and the more recent one uh, earlier this year in January uh, 2020 that you see on your uh, right-hand side, and both are av uh, available online. Next sl slide, please. So in our work in uh, 2018, uh, we identified 128 coal mines in 12 different member states, uh, as well as 207 coal-fired power plants in 21 uh, different member states. Uh, we also foresee a drop in this capacity from 150 gigawatt that we estimated back in 2016 to 105 gigawatt in 2025 and around 55 gigawatt in uh, 2030. Next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, estimated the employment that is uh, associated with the coal sector in Europe uh, by estimating uh, 52,700 jobs in uh, coal-fired power plants, as well as 185,000 jobs in coal mining. This uh, range in, uh, in different member states from nearly 100 to Sweden up to uh, 13,500 in Poland for coal-fired power plants, and from 300 in Italy to 99,500 in Poland when it comes to coal mining. These jobs are also associated with uh, indirect employment, uh, for which our estimation is uh, that it is around uh, 215,000 indirect jobs. Next slide, please. So, Moving forward, we adopted a, a forward-looking approach to estimate uh, what is the potential for, for the, the coal regions when it comes to clean energies and what are their available options. Next slide, please. So our latest study uh, includes both what is already happening by identifying uh, activities uh, with regards to batteries facilities, but also options that the regions could have to reclaim, to reclaim uh, coal mines, uh, to deploy renewable energy technologies, and namely wind and solar uh, projects. But also looking forward, we estimate uh, the technical potential for the regions to deploy renewable energies, as well as uh, energy savings in the residential sector. Uh, next uh, slide, please. We see uh, that in many cases the transition is already happening uh, with, uh, for example, I have here two examples, one in Hungary with a former coal mine uh, being uh, transformed to a solar PV uh, plant, as well as in Germany where uh, wind energy uh, farm, uh, farms are deployed. Next slide, please. So when it comes to energy savings uh, specifically, we estimate considerable uh, potential for, for the coal regions, uh, especially given that most of the existing buildings do not comply with uh, current energy performance requirements, as well as taking into account the rates of renovation that are currently very low. Uh, for example, for Germany that we find the highest uh, potential among uh, the coal regions, uh, these energy, energy savings can be uh, can equal up to 6% of the 2017 national primary energy consumption. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, specifically on clean energy uh, technical potential in the coal regions, again, we find significant potential for the majority of the regions and for different options um, uh, for, for the regions themselves. Just to, to put a bit of, uh, of context, uh, for wind, for example, we find that uh, the maximum technical potential in the coal regions, if deployed, could uh, provide almost five times what, uh, 
what uh, was installed in the whole EU in 2017. Similarly, for solar PV, uh, we find this to be almost six times uh, what is currently installed in, in Europe. Uh, next slide, please. So just to, to address uh, what Andre said in the beginning, our results uh, are, uh, were of course produced well, well in advance uh, of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, uh, but maybe, and given the, the, um, uh, the intentions in Europe to link the recovery with the European Green Deal, uh, the chance of uh, actually realizing this potential and uh, making it happen uh, may be even higher. Uh, so maybe it's, it's maybe the best time uh, for this potential to, uh, to realize. And uh, at this point, I will hand it over to my colleague, uh, Pablo Ruiz, to discuss about the implications that we, we estimate uh, for the coal regions in their transition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Zoe. Thank you very much, Andre, for your introduction. So let me take it over from this point. Like we have quantified the, the magnitude of the challenge, we have quantified the magnitude of the, the magnitude of the potential available. So let me try now to explain you how much of this potential could be reasonable uh, realized in short and near and long term. Um, to give a context to this assessment. We decided to adopt the EUCO 32 32.5 scenario, which is, as you may know, um, developed by the European Commission to assess what it, it does imply the achievement of given uh, energy targets. Uh, specifically, the EUCO 32 32.5 uh, does assess what it would imply to achieve the current 32.5 energy efficiency target, 32% renewable uh, energy target by 2030 as it was formulated in the Clean Energy for All Europeans package. As you may know, um, this assessment is carried on with the PRIMES modeling suite, which includes um, a part of cost optimization, but also uh, some behavioral petition patterns. Within this modeling exercise that is publicly available, uh, we have to try to understand what could it be likely it's a regional impact for that we develop a regional uh, model, regionalization model that does that from a national level, uh, try to infer what it could be the regional impact. And then uh, we assess employment associated with the corresponding development of uh, the target technologies in, in that uh, country, therefore in that region. Uh, next slide, please. How do we do that uh, as a first step? Um, there are, it's very difficult to try to establish like from a national level what it will happen at a regional level. There are different fields of science and knowledge dealing with that. For example, technology diffusion, resource evaluation, um, investment analysis and so on and so forth. So what we did is we put together the key variable and the key data available for, uh, for that fields like uh, installed capacity, the potentials we assess, uh, GDP in the um, regional competitiveness index and the alike. We put them together and we generated the scenarios to see what will be this regional distribution of the national context uh, if we consider those variables, even then different weights. That generates us uh, scenarios of regional weighting that you can see in the slide. Like for example, Bulgaria 34 uh, region will take like from 15% to 30% of the nationally developed wind. And with those percentages, we analyzed what well, it will be the maximum uh, possible potential to be captured by a region. With that, we can go from the national European context to uh, a likelihood regional development. Next slide, please. And then once we have uh, the regional impact of the national uh, evolution, we have to assess the the impact in terms of employment. To do so, we have to fold approach for wind and PV technologies. We applied a method that we developed in house at the Joint Research Center. That is basically a job factor based uh, method that does extensive use of the information available on trade and on technology learning for the for these two technologies along the whole value chain. So taking into consideration the different labor intensities of the different activities such as manufacturing or operation and maintenance. For the so-called 
diffuse technologies like uh, biomass or energy efficiency. We adopted a, uh, an alternative approach uh, called trace, trace investment. It's somehow inspired in your observer method that we account for the investment required to realize the change and we distribute those investment across activity sectors. Once the investment is assigned to a given across activity sector, we can translate it to employment user using their labor and sectorial intensities. So with that, we have from uh, national capacity deployment, energy system transformation, national employment, and regional employment. We put all this together and then next slide, please. And we can compare with um, the exposure or the current relevance of a of a given region to coal activities that so introduced previously with the potential likely to be realized in that region. Doing so, uh, you can see three main clusters or type of situations. Of the whole regions, uh, we found like 28 regions. Uh, you can see that dotted dark line means the current exposure that those regions face. And you can see it counterface with the potential that they very likely could achieve. Most of the regions can achieve, uh, they have huge potential compared to the current exposure to, to the coal sector, um, 28 in total. There are other seven regions that have a kind of even exposure to coal activities and will need to make sure that they develop a significant share of the potential that they hold. And um, there are also seven regions that um, the potential identified when compared to the current exposure to the coal sector uh, shows a case where they will need to identify additional potentials than those that we consider it to ensure a smooth transition. So it is not only we see that generally speaking there is a huge potential, but we also can point the uh, the different types of support that each regions will need to ensure deployment, to boost it a little bit, or to even find uh, identify additional potentials. With all that together, next slide, please. We can bring uh, some highlighting conclusions. For example, by 2030, if we consider the EUCO 3230 to 0.5 scenario, which we can consider now even as a conservative, because one, as you know, everyone is talking about increased ambition and what what the Green Deal will require us to go further. Uh, we can see that. 315,000 jobs could be created induced by deployment of renewable energy technologies in these regions to be compared to the current exposure of 200,000. Um, as said, that's generally speaking altogether on a case by case uh, analysis, you will have to tailor uh, your, the type of support that these regions will need to ensure as smooth transition. Therefore, uh, concluding now, Next slide, please. What can we say after uh, all this uh, series of studies we have carried out? It is clear that the development of uh, renewable energy sources can facilitate or even ensure a very smooth transition from a uh, post uh, coal wall in these regions. Uh, there's a already a um, remarkable uh, infrastructure and culture of industrial activity in these regions that can be a key leverage for, for this transition for to ensure a properly tailor-made uh, support to this region is clear to ensure the close cooperation between all the agents implied like companies regulators and based investors and local uh, communities and while there's a challenge uh, there's clearly a potential to, to achieve that uh, wanted a smooth transition to a decarbonized economy and a decarbonized energy sector. The numbers altogether, 315,000 jobs could be induced in these regions if they follow only the EU of 30 to 32.5 scenario to be compared with the 200,000 uh, direct jobs related to coal activities currently in these regions. That's all from my side. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much to, to both of you. Um, very relevant, very interesting, and I think lots of food for thought uh, 
to the for the panel and also uh, hopefully for people asking questions i encourage you to uh, ask more questions um, as we move forward and now as we as announced earlier time for a little breather so online questionnaire so there will be three questions they are really meant to test uh, what you think about the topic but also how you're feeling so the uh, first one is the first question is as follows. There is much hope about the potential of green recovery, but walking the talk is always a challenge. Do you believe that Europe will succeed in using the COVID-19 crisis to truly boost the clean energy transition? And here we'll have yes or no answers. The second question, and we'll display all the questions together, where do you identify the major roadblocks to fully realize the post-COVID-19 green recovery transition? And here you can pick up to three answers and you'll have the following options eu policies again we're talking about major roadblocks eu policies national policies regional policies lobbying from carbon intensive industries knowledge on good practices business engagement civil society engagement mentality and attitudes of stakeholders and finally systemic inertia of the old way and question number three where we'll ask you to pick one answer it's about your feeling. And the question is simply, how are you feeling in this moment about the clean energy transition of Europe? And you can choose among certain, hopeful, anxious, puzzled, or perhaps disappointed. And those answers will comment quickly on them and hopefully they can also uh, serve as inspiration for the, for the panel. So I think uh, if I can ask now to, to start the poll, it's, uh, we ask you to, to be quick and to scroll to the bottom because all three questions are shown simultaneously. There's also question number three, and we are giving you two and a half, maybe three minutes uh, to complete that. Once the poll is closed, then we'll show the results. Thank you.
Hey, Elisa, have we have we closed the poll now? Yes, we have. Um, thanks very much. So um, we see here from question one, as you can see, the question about the hope, uh, the question about uh, believing that Europe will succeed. 45% of people think they, they will. No answer by 36 people. So I wonder whether that's sort of the technical glitch or actually could be the case that people are not sure. So I think those people, like in every election, those people, I think we should uh, make sure we, we speak to them. And of course, people who uh, think negatively, this is even a harder word. But I think the 36% the, the is quite um, quite a number. Then when you look at the, where do you identify the roadblocks, so clearly the, the winners here are, well, again, no answer is the winner, but from people who, national policy, so this is interesting, so uh, policies on a country level, on a member state level, 35%, lobbying from carbon intensive industries, 27, mentality, 28, and systemic inertia. Those are the, the, the biggest factors people identify. Um, interesting that EU policies are considered only uh, nine percent, so that's the lowest. So I think uh, this is a this is an interesting uh, confirmation of a role the, the the European Union and the, the institutions are playing in in this process. And then finally, questions number three, uh, just to test people's feeling. Forty one percent haven't answered, but then people feel hopeful. Forty one percent, and that is really a good sign um, uh, at this sort of very dynamic and uncertain moment. Um, however, you can see that only 1% of the people feel certain. Uh, so that's really an interesting, interesting result and anxious, puzzled, 8%, disappointed only 2%. So I think overall it's, it, it shows that uh, people are ready to discuss and, and implement that change. I would, that's my interpretation of the the polling. Thanks very much for for taking part of that uh, in the in the in the little questionnaire and the little polling. And I think now we can move to our next agenda item, uh, and that is our roundtable. So here we will have four panelists. Each of them will receive a one quick Kickstarter question from me, and I will really ask to keep the answer to three, three and a half minutes long, because the idea is just to kickstart and inspire uh, people to, uh, our participants to, to pose questions, but also other fellow panelists to, to respond. So here are the four panelists. The first one is Michaela Hall, who works at DG Energy of the European Commission, the unit responsible for renewable energies and CCS policies. She is dealing in particular with issues such as infrastructure, renewable industry policies, and renewable energy finance. Prior to that, she was working on energy efficiency in buildings and was also a parliamentary researcher at the European Parliament. The second panelist is Victoria Kerelska, who is the head of advocacy and messaging at Wind Europe. So she has experience in leading advocacy on issues such as government regulation, the renewable energy directive, state aid, uh, and prior to that, she was working in institutions such as IRENA, Energy Cities, and the very European Commission as well. The third panelist is Naomi Chevilla, who is a policy advisor at Solar Power Europe. She follows the main European legislation related to renewables, especially in relation to support schemes, energy taxation, and grid integration of solar, but also industrial and transport portfolios. Prior to that, she was working in the French transmission system operator RTE and also the European Affairs Secretariat to the French Prime Minister. And the fourth panelist is Catherine uh, Poseidon, who you already uh, know and she already presented. So, Michaela, um, my question to you is, is as follows. Um, we know that DG Energy has a very special role in driving the EU energy transition and people I think people are overwhelmed a bit by the variety of uh, legislative proposals and strategies that the, the European Commission has published in the past months. So I would really ask you if you could to mention three major actions or initiatives on renewable energies 
during the next 12 months that would support the transition as part of the green recovery. Michela, over to you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, very well. well great. Um, thanks a lot. It is great to, for the first time, actually reach out to your platform. I contributed already to many briefings in DGN, so it's good to also get to know the community, at least virtually. Um, and uh, very interesting discussion. I also clicked on hopeful because I do think it's really um, a great moment. Uh, uh, we have this recovery plan, which gives a lot of money, even million to just transition fund. And we have a good dynamics uh, that already was explained by Bloomberg that even on economics only um, coal is uh, uh, phasing out faster than we thought. Um, I can tell you, not only you are confused uh, with all the initiatives that are going on with the Green Deal. It is quite, it is quite uh, heavy working going on at the moment in the Commission. And in addition, the recovery plan that comes on top and adds up to it. Um, I want to highlight what uh, was already referred to by the JOC colleague. What we are doing at the moment is we are revising our energy and climate targets for 2030. Um, with a view to have 55%, up to 55% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. So a bit of a steeper, steeper trend to 2030 to keep uh, to keep track of uh, to keep to be on the path of a 1.5 degree scenario. Um, this will then also possibly result in an upwards revision of the renewables target specifically. Um, we have at the moment the EU climate law in in negotiations, which will enshrine our net zero 2050 ambition in law for the first time. That's currently in, in discussion between the parliament and the member states. So all of this to say that I think the direction of travel is very clear. And that is usually helpful because it can then provide a framework for investments. Um, so then what we've seen, uh, from the JLC study, I just want, I, I use it a lot also as a reference, because I think it can really give a first, uh, first hints on what could be done. And then also, if I come back to, um, what our poll said, what, a, what the stumbling blocks are, I think we, we can address some of these things. So we heard national policies and inertia and knowledge about how to do it. And I think what's coming up around with the recovery plan that we intend to have um, technical assistance and support. So not only for the coal regions, but for all the member states that have to draft their recovery plans uh, where they identify investment needs and projects. So here, I think we can go a long way and, for example, you know, um, share best practice and recommend what green reforms are, what good investments are. Um, so I think this will be very important. Let's say, for example, um, the JRC uh, pointed to the, um, the geothermal potential, which I think is really in fascinating um, from a point of renewables, but we are really it's more, almost at zero at the moment. The potential is very high in some countries like Slovakia. Uh, and what is so beautiful about it that you could actually transfer the mining and the engineering skills in a good way. So if we manage to work with the member states together to, to, to develop assistance on these kind of things, by the way, also the European Investment Bank has dialogues with member states. At the moment, they focus on the member states that are modernization fund recipients. So there are also a few coal mine regions in there. So they can also assist. Um, final point, um, so, um, we have uh, a few instruments that want to push member states to uh, develop renewables in cooperation. And that can be interesting because the countries that use the former coal mining areas for large scale, say PV or wind, they could enter into a cooperation with another member state and offer those renewables productions and the cost and the benefits and the renewable statistics would then be shared. There's one concrete example, which I think is beautiful because it really shows how you go from 
from coal to the future that is currently being discussed. It is in a former coal region in Portugal, Sinj, that tries to, you know, to orient itself towards the future. And the plan is to build a large scale PV production site on that coal mining area, transform it there into hydrogen, which will then be shipped to the port of Rotterdam because the Dutch have ambitious plans to use the existing gas infrastructure and turn it into a hydrogen based economy. And uh, so basically these two countries want to work together on this project. And this shows very well what the possibilities could be there. Because as we've seen, the potential in these areas is huge, be it PV or wind. I stop here because I think I already spoke too long. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Michaela. Uh, just a uh, short update. Uh, it is clear that we've uh, we've been presenting interesting stuff because the number of participants has increased. We are now at a uh, mark of 220, including the, the panelists. So thanks very much for staying with us. So uh, now I'm going to move to Victoria and Naomi. Um, wind and solar power um, are often mentioned together while discussing renewables. So it's great that we have representatives of the, both of those sectors in one panel. So my question here is, could you specify how concretely wind in case of Victoria and solar in case of Naomi will contribute to the EU energy transition, focusing on the regional development of benefits? And please, in answering your question, if you could uh, also uh, include the, 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 the aspect of the job creation potential for your respective sector, that would be amazing. Victoria, uh, over to you. Yes, many thanks. And let me just try if the camera would also work in the meantime. I hope so. I hope that you can see me. So um, I would allow myself just to pick up a little bit on what also the previous speakers have said with a couple of introductory remarks. And then I will speak a little bit also about the, the, the contribution of wind uh, to these regions. Now, I am prompted just to mention here the bigger picture, and we've been talking quite a lot about this, that we have a clear objective for 2050, and that is that we're aiming to be climate neutral here in Europe. And I think that there is also very critical uh, policy direction that has been set by, by the European Commission, and that is that for us to be climate neutral by then, uh, we need to very significantly decarbonize cross sectors. And the way forward to doing this would be as you increase the electricity contribution in different sectors, and that should be mostly driven by renewables. And I'm saying this because if you look at the different decarbonization scenarios that Europe has, uh, wind energy, our sector, would be actually accounting for half of all the Europe's electricity in 2050. And therefore, how we manage to do the transition towards renewables-based electrification is critical here, and especially when we are discussing how to move also towards our recovery plans and our long-term goals under the Green Deal. Um, and I think it's also important to keep this in mind when we discuss how are we going to be using and spending the money from the Just Transition Fund going forward. Now, in terms of concretely how is wind energy and coal regions in transition uh, already, um, let's say, collaborating together, I think there are a couple of things to, to also bear in mind. Um, the potential for wind energy in such regions is quite significant and actually we have already a significant installed base in, in these regions that uh, you know can help uh, with their with their decarbonization and transition and maybe just to give a couple of examples but if you think for instance Poland in Silesia we're talking there already about 10.3 gigawatts of wind that is installed in Spain in Castilla and Leon it's it's uh, 5.7 gigawatts so the potential is there and as Catherine was mentioning also at the very beginning the cost argumentation would more and more lean towards renewable electricity because uh, on wind energy both onshore and offshore wind together with solar wind are today the most cost competitive sources of new power generation so increasingly it would make fully economic sense uh, for governments and for investors to go for these technologies and i'm also saying this because coal heavy regions can really benefit um, from from the wind growth not only because it would provide the clean sustainable uh, electricity that you would need but also because it would do it at the most cost efficient way for society um, and here I also allow myself to pick up on something else that the colleagues from GRC also mentioned is that there is a significant local and economic benefits um, that are already happening in such regions when they're transitioning towards wind. 
And I here would really like to speak with concrete examples and give a couple of numbers, which in my opinion, at least maybe are not so well known. But in terms of job creation, and I here would pick again uh, on Poland, uh, Poland, for instance, is one of the countries that has already quite significant jobs uh, in the supply chain for offshore wind in Europe. They have approximately 4,000 jobs because they're developing uh, foundations and cranes for offshore wind turbine that are afterwards used everywhere around Europe. And I'm saying this because just yesterday the Polish government and uh, the Polish renewable energy industry signed a very important letter of intent that they would be developing even further uh, offshore wind in Poland. So that already gives you in there the possibility to pitch on the supply chain that you currently have, expand it even further in the coming years with the offshore volumes that would be developed, and eventually um, develop even more and have job creation happening on the ground. Um, with onshore and offshore wind, we have also seen that significant coal regions previously have contributed for concrete uh, local development. And maybe here another good example that I'm always uh, trying to give just to illustrate uh, how we are contributing is again from Poland, uh, from the municipality of Margonin. Uh, which is a municipality of 6,000 people uh, and they started doing their transition with wind energy and in the process, the, the way that they developed their today 60 wind turbines that they currently have, park with 60 megawatts, um, they managed essentially to significantly upgrade uh, their local infrastructure because of the contribution that the wind turbines were, were uh, giving to the local uh, budget. Let me just say that in the period of construction of the wind turbine, um, the, the local municipalities was receiving 25% uh, contribution from taxes. So it was afterwards used to upgrade roads, to construct new facilities that were benefiting the local community such as football stadium uh, and even looking uh, towards today there has also been significant job creation because for the operation and maintenance in these turbines we still continue to see the jobs that have been created but also strictly in terms of the uh, local contribution and the way that the wind turbine was put forth there was approximately 15 subcontractors on the ground that were um, that were used and that were hired in the process uh, to make sure that these turbines are seeing the place. And this municipality today is actually one of the richest in Poland, exactly because of the contribution that the WIC center, the WIC sector has been um, uh, given to them uh, and the development of wind that has been happening. Uh, and one last point which I would like to touch upon is on the on the issue of skills because the energy transition would require really, uh, especially in coal regions, that we think a little bit how we can transfer the useful skills that workers currently have towards the jobs of the future. This would very much uh, depend on whether we are able to set up the appropriate trainings on the ground uh, as soon as possible so that we can uh, enact this transition quickly. And in there, we already have concrete projects in the wind sector which are aiming to retrain uh, coal workers into wind jobs. One such is in uh, the Jui Valley in Romania, another one is in the making in Silesia in Poland. And as we're talking about how to use also the just transition mechanism to uh, really concretely enact this transition, I think uh, having funding for reskilling would also be one critical uh, enabler in, in how we, we get there and we also need to keep that in mind. So for the moment I would end it here and I'm also happy afterwards to, to take uh, concrete questions. Excellent. Thanks very much. Uh, so now, uh, without further ado, um, uh, let's move to Naomi. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, first. Thank you for the invitation uh, to this platform. Um, I think for us, it's very interesting to be in touch with this platform and with with the regions. Um, we've tried in the past year to organize events uh, locally in the in the regions that are transitioning. Unfortunately. They were cancelled due to the to the to the situation. That we hope to organize uh, more uh, meetings with you locally with our members uh, in the future when the situation has improved. Um, so um, you were asking about the the concrete benefits of uh, of solar. I can share a, a couple of messages. The first one, the first message that I would like to share is uh, is a message that we already uh, heard from other speakers. It's about the cost of the technologies. Uh, it's a message that we shared already a lot, but it's true that we are at the moment in a revolution where we have solar and wind uh, being the most cost-competitive technologies uh, 
available, the most competitive energy technologies available. Uh, in 10 years, we had a, a cost decline of uh, minus 80% uh, of solar technologies, and that's continuing, we continue improving. Um, so I think this is, this is a, a really strong uh, uh, argument to, to invest into, into uh, solar. On top of that, uh, there is potential in coal regions. Uh, we have uh, listened to the assessment of the GRC on the potential uh, of, of solar in uh, informal coal regions, but we also see this already happening. Uh, to give you an example, uh, Germany is, of course, one of the largest uh, solar markets. But it's been two years that um, uh, Poland is, for example, one of our top five uh, markets in Europe. And we see a lot of investments happening uh, on uh, in solar technologies in Poland. Um, on top of that, uh, if we touch on the question of cost of integrating uh, solar in the system, in the grid, I think uh, we have here as well a lot of innovations available, a lot of technologies, a lot of know-how in Europe based on batteries, based on smart grids, based on smart inverters, technologies that can really uh, allow for a, a cost-effective integration uh, of solar and wind technologies in the grid. Uh, and we see a lot of uh, innovation happening. Um, and, uh, and even uh, bearing in mind that as well, uh, these technologies are interesting from a security of supply point of view. Um, if we look at a future where we'll have more climate, um, uh, more uh, extreme weather, weather events, uh, and uh, when we see that solar is, for example, quite resilient to, uh, to extreme heat, for example, in the summer, because it does not rely on, uh, on water, for example. So, what does this mean for uh, citizens and businesses? I think it's really an opportunity to access uh, cheaper and more reliable uh, electricity. Uh, we see a lot of companies uh, investing into uh, self-consumption with solar, uh, in uh, PPAs, which are direct contracts um, where a company benefits from the energy produced from a, a solar plant uh, directly. On top of that, and on top of that fact, uh, you were asking about the regional, uh, the, the regional uh, development opportunities. So, um, as Victoria mentioned uh, already, I think, uh, and as previous presenters uh, already mentioned, uh, we have a lot of opportunities uh, in jobs creation. Um, solar is one of the most uh, intensive uh, is one of the technologies that is the most uh, job intensive. To give you an idea, we speak about uh, 1,100 jobs created per terawatt hour of electricity uh, produced in Europe. Those jobs are located most importantly in the downstream value chain. It's, for example, uh, installers, it's project developers, it's uh, operation and maintenance service providers, and it's jobs that are um, very much located in SMEs that are very local and that are not easy to uh, delocalize. And I think there is a, a real synergy here with uh, that can be built with you with a former um, coal project. Uh, I have in here an example, uh, a recent announcement, I think last year, of the Polish company Enea, um, who uh, proposed to invest uh, into a 30 megawatt uh, solar project on the mine. Uh, employing uh, former employees in the installation. Beyond that topic, uh, what we also see in Europe is uh, a new dynamism of the solar manufacturing industry. Um, we have in Europe, uh, we're not a leader in manufacturing solar cells and panels, but we remain an industrial leader. We remain a leader in the, in the technologies, and in particular, we have uh, the, the, the skills and the technologies that will be the basis for uh, the next generation of solar panels and solar cells. And uh, what we see at the moment is a real dynamism, a, a willingness of solar manufacturing companies to reinvest for new activities in Europe. Uh, as a matter of fact, Solar Power Europe launched um, this year a solar manufacturing accelerator, a project that uh, will encourage industrial consortiums to be to be built uh, and to be realized in the next year. And among uh, the 10 most major uh, projects that we selected, we have uh, four in uh, Germany, uh, one in Hungary, one in Czech Republic, one in Slovenia, and uh, one being developed in uh, Poland. So um, 
And this is uh, more or less areas where uh, where we see potential, of course, and but but this requires both political vision and investment. And uh, if you allow me to conclude on on that, I think we really look at the just transition fund uh, with a lot of hope. I think this uh, this fund is really a, a positive. It can uh, invest into uh, concrete projects, but it's also important that it invests into training programs to 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 make sure that we have the right installers, the right uh, skills locally. Um, and of course, that it supports the, the development of industrial projects locally. Uh, and that's why we uh, really look forward to the next steps on this negotiation and hope that uh, it will be focused on the right, uh, the right activities. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks very much, Naomi. And uh, finally, Catherine, you already, we already had Catherine presenting the, the, the white paper. But I have a question to you, and this is more like about the recovery packages. We know that they are discussed in trillion of dollars, um, uh, and they always seem to be high level macro interventions. If you were to say a few recommendations that would be relevant for people on this call, uh, on this seminar, which are representing the European regions, what would that be uh, your recommendation regarding benefits from those packages to 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 the coal regions, uh, coal and carbon intensive regions. Over to you. Thank you. Sure, sure. Um, I think that we are really at, at a crucial moment that it's it's going to be imperative that coal regions and and countries as well take advantage of the momentum that that is gathering recently. From from my perspective, there you know, there's quite a, a clear parallel between the idea of just transition, which is not new for these regions, and green recovery. You know, just transition is essentially advocating for you know, recovery for areas that have been hard hit by you know, industries that are no longer as competitive as they once were, and you know, hoping to invest in, in a more sustainable future to bring growth back to those regions. And now the green recovery idea is essentially similar, except it's an economy-wide uh, plan. So at this point, BNF is tracking um, you know, the high-level pledges that have been made, uh, and so far we've seen something like $40 billion globally in green support, with I think almost $19 billion directly for carbon-intensive sectors. But those high-level um, you know, announcements, plans are good, and I think have have made a very important first step of in gathering momentum and bringing the conversation of just transition to become sort of more mainstream. Um, but an effective green stimulus from from our perspective really involves a number of different points. Um, the first is probably that it needs to be ready to roll out quickly. Um, and I think this is probably one of going to be one of the biggest challenges for the EU and for European regions where you know, a stimulus at the EU level is great and you know making sure that all of those funds are available and support is also going to be essential but without a domestic policy framework and you know clear plans laid out in in, um, in the just transition plans that funding may not be able to to go directly and immediately to the areas where it needs to and I'm thinking particularly of for example renewables policies in some of the coal regions and, and countries that we've discussed today um, you know, without, for example, an, an auction program or some kind of support for small-scale PV, it's going to be difficult to accelerate um, you know, new growth in those sectors uh, now. So basically, there needs to be, in parallel with a green stimulus plan that can roll out quickly, you know, sort of a landing site within the countries where you know, pro projects can be developed um, rapidly and effectively. And with that, we also need to make sure that whatever investments are made really do provide good value for money and uh, can create jobs. Um, I think that today, you know, we've we've spoken a lot about the job creating potential of, of the renewable sector, so I won't really go into that. Um, but we also look at, you know, an effective green stimulus should, where possible, increase private sector consumption and participation, um, and in that case, you know, we could look at getting communities more involved in developing renewables projects, potentially tackling issues of NIMBYism and, you know, resistance to renewables installations by bringing local communities into the development process. And, you know, even governments looking at 
what kind of incentives they can offer to um, citizens who may not want a wind uh, you know, installation near their homes? Are there ways that governments can, can smooth over those issues? And then you know, finally, a, an effective green stimulus should also, of course, contribute to emissions reduction, um, but also improve resilience overall. Um, and this is another area in terms of policy making where a, a clear target that is realistic um, but also has you know longer term visibility for investors is quite important. You know, we've seen in a number of um, the countries where these coal regions are um, renewables policies that have at some point um, been axed or subsidies have been cut, um, you know, which has a damaging uh, effect on investor confidence longer term that takes some time to, to try and mitigate. So at this point, you know, to, try, to take advantage of the momentum behind the green transition and the potential that renewables bring, I think it will also be really important that governments at both a national and regional level put in a clear framework that makes it obvious to investors that the commitment is there um, and that, you know, th these destinations may not be sort of top of the list uh, for renewables, but they should be on the table and should be on the agenda. Um, so at this point, I still think that there there are a number of challenges, but I also ticked the box as hopeful um, because from my perspective, the conversation has accelerated much more rapidly than we anticipated. Um, just you know, joining the virtual meetings this week, I feel like there's a lot more energy and clear direction on um, you know, the, the real potential that, that coal regions will be able to play in, in the green recovery going forward. Amazing. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Katrin. So now with a bit less than 20 minutes, um, let's move to, to, the, to the panel and the questions. So I'm proposing the following. I will ask four questions selected from, from the list. Um, and I will ask concrete panelists to answer them. And after that, if we still have time, and I hope we, we will, and please, that's my appeal to panelists to be, to be really short. If some other panelists want to comment on any of the aspects, please maybe just turn your video on so that I can, I can see that you want to, to say something. Some of the questions may be difficult, so I apologize for this, but I think we shouldn't shy away from, from posing those questions. So the first two questions will be for Michaela. And the first one is as follows. One of the tools initially considered for the recovery framework was a renewable energy acceleration program based on EU tenders for 7.5 gigawatt within each of the next two years. Can you confirm if this scheme will indeed be included in either the recovery plan or the just transition mechanism? And then one more question to, to Michaela. And that is about, it's, I think, very relevant for many, many countries, especially, I mean, for many stakeholders, especially the civil society. Negotiations on fossil uh, gas and JTF are still ongoing, given that the least cost pathway for Bulgaria, Poland, Czechia, and Romania was shown to depend on renewables. How do you comment on the efforts to include fossil gas investment in the scope of the Just Transition Fund? So this will be from Kiela, and of course I give you a few seconds to 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 prepare while I'm, I'm I'll, I'll read out two questions to other panelists. So then there is this question that I think I, I see um, a lot uh, in uh, in various fora, which is basically uh, a question on um, I'm just scr scrolling. Yes, so this is a, a differentiation between um, uh, hard coal and lignite. So the second will be for 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 Katrin, since there are different in terms of costs today's and long term. How do you differentiate between hard and lignite coal? So that will be a, a question because we have people from. Uh, hard coal and lignite regions uh, in the platform and on, on this on this webinar. And finally, the question that I would like to pose to Naomi and Victoria, and that is the, the typical question, especially in very coal dependent countries and regions. Um, and this is about um, the base load. So, 
yeah so the question is yeah so a huge portion of the new build presented for instance by Catherine is solar and onshore wind how is this regarded as base load so if i could pose that question to to now in victoria that would be amazing so uh michaela uh hope you're ready to 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 tackle those two questions um if that's okay then i'll i'll i'll, I'll hand over to you uh sure um so the first question was uh concerned um uh, an earlier version of our communication that we tabled end of May on the recovery spending no? that came also with a revised budget. And it is true that in these earlier versions, we uh, actually proposed setting up an EU-wide tendering scheme worth 50 billion uh, to support the, um, the acceleration of renewables and to also compensate um, for the COVID effect that we observed on renewables, that uh, uh, projects were put on hold, um, although we now see that actually the effect might not be as heavy as we thought, but still. So this idea was then not in the final proposal, meaning that there was no concrete budget allocated to it. However, um, we have this huge component, the biggest pot of money for the member states, where every member state has an allocation based on a formula, which we're still negotiating, but it was uh, 560 billion that need to be spent at the latest by December 2024. And um, what needs to happen now is that basically the member states, because there it's the member states that run the national authorities, allocate part of this money to renewables auctioning schemes and renewables projects that is um, that basically would uh, would account for early absorption, which is necessary for this money, because, as I said, it will have to be spent within the next three years. So in a way, uh, this, even though it's not specifically there in the EU budget, you can still use the money as member state for this. And that is what we are intending to promote with member states. Uh, already in a meeting next week, we will present these ideas to them that that should be done. Um, there's, and then we will see to what extent we can add on with other EU budgets, be it InvestEU, for example, instruments to reduce the cost of capital which in some regions that had these retroactive changes and uncertainty, they pay much more for the same windmill. And there could be some arrangements uh, involving, for example, the EIB, that you reduce the cost of capital, which would have a massive impact on renewables investments in certain places. Uh, second question, um, just transition fund negotiation. I'm not completely maybe up to date i did read something that the member states agreed to exclude gas funding as part of this fund but i'm not i'm i don't know at which stage this is i'm not particularly um involved what i would say um well i'm speaking now as a policy officer on renewables um i think at the moment we've seen the cost curves and given that investments now, if we replace aging coal plants, uh, they stay around for 30 to 40 years, it could be justified that um, the fund money, which is the grant part, is really focused on the ones that are uh, on renewables and energy efficiency. But it doesn't mean that, for example, you wouldn't need a, a certain amount of gas. But for that, I think you can also work with what what is around the just transition fund um but as i said i'm not uh, i'm not fully in the in the picture on these negotiations okay uh, thanks very much uh, so then katrin league night and call question sure um the the short answer is that yes separate lignite and hard coal capacity um, in the modeling and we have different prices for for each the lignite price is uh, more or less fixed over time, where we connected the hard cold price um, to market dynamics um, going up 30. Um, I'm happy to share those 
in fact, it would be quite interesting for, for our side as well, because understanding the the cost of lignite extraction, especially, it was was quite a challenge. Where, from a utilities perspective, there's a tendency to say that it doesn't cost anything if you know the the mine is also owned by whoever owns the power plant. Um, but of course, that isn't true. Um, but we did keep, in general, have have lower costs for lignite. Um, I think in all cases we had lower costs for lignite than for hard coal, and we also differentiate. Um, between the different assets and we had uh, different classes of hard coal depending on age and efficiency um, and things like that. Does that answer the question? Well, yeah, I think so. Uh, thank you. Uh, and then the question on the base load. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe Victoria could go first and then uh, followed by Naomi. Yes, I would very much like to comment on this one and I hope that this time around uh, Maybe you would also be able to see my camera, so hello. Um, I just want to try to share, uh, if I manage, one, one slide. Maybe it would not work. No, I, I would not manage, but uh, we at Wind Europe, we are measuring every single day what was the share of electricity produced by wind energy the day before. And we are actually looking at this aggregated data throughout the whole year. And let me just tell you that there is absolutely no single day throughout the year when you don't have wind energy blowing in the European energy system. Uh, meaning that renewables and wind in particular are providing uh, baseload power irrespective of what has been said or people are commenting on. But uh, last year in 2019, the lowest that we've had was 5% on a single day throughout the, the whole year. The highest that we've had was, uh, I think, 30%. And on average in the whole year, wind energy has been producing 15% of Europe's electricity. Now, going forward, of course, wind energy is a variable source, but you know that as we increase the capacities in renewables, there would be a couple of elements also in the integration of European energy systems that would be helping um, on how we optimize the use of these sources in the energy system. And there, of course, storage, demand response, uh, stronger electricity grids and better interconnections between European markets would be critical on how this baseload power can flow in different European countries. And from this perspective, this is something that the whole European Union would be working on and would also be a critical aspect also of the whole package on the recovery plan on how we support the infrastructure that can help us uh, build this renewables-based system. So I think on this point, this is what I, I would like to share. And if you're interested uh, to having the slide that I'm referring to, uh, you can always drop me uh, a line here on the chat and I'm happy to forward this to you so that you can, you can see it graphically represented. I think uh, it speaks a ton. Uh, sorry, thank you very much. Perhaps you can just add, send it to us, to the Secretariat, and then we can maybe add it or add to your slide pack uh, or whatever. Just, just add that slide and we can maybe share it somehow. Thank you. Naomi. Yes, uh, so again, I, I think as well as Victoria, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, first, I would like to, to share that uh, solar is, is a, as well producing uh, more than we think. We have the vision of solar uh, producing only on the, in the summer, but it's actually also quite performing in the winter and, and throughout the year. Um, we also have the vision of solar as intermittent, but it's actually, we prefer the term variable, uh, which means that uh, we know that it's not producing by clicking on a button, let's say, uh, but we have the capacity to uh, forecast quite precisely when solar will produce and therefore prepare uh, for uh, the moment when solar uh, will produce. Um, now, indeed, I think uh, the solution lies into uh, the, a mix of technologies, a mix of uh, renewable uh, technologies. Uh, we know that uh, there are uh, at the moment on some, some projects ongoing, mixing uh, wind and solar, for example, or uh, solar and hydro, for example. So these are, uh, thanks to the, the mix of these technologies, uh, we're able to provide, uh, to supply a base load, uh, base load supply, uh, energy supply to the system. Um, then, of course, we will have enabling technologies uh, so I'm thinking of uh, batteries, for example, that uh, fit quite well with uh, solar and uh, and probably in uh, in a few years, in some years, uh, hydrogen that will be able to store electricity produced on solar and then release electricity in the network. 
Um, in fact, we have modeled that uh, very recently with a university, La Parenta University in Finland, which has a, a model that is able to model the European energy system uh, on an hourly basis. And uh, we found that uh, if we uh, go for a 100% renewable energy scenario by 2050, we, there is no, uh, no risk of failure uh, if we implement, uh, if, if we develop the right technologies. And on top of that, uh, we also made a cost estimate what would happen if we go for this 100% renewable uh, energy scenario um, and we develop batteries, etc. And we found that, uh, again, the, the costs are quite good. It's uh, on average 6% lower than uh, the, the, non, the, the climate neutral scenario developed by the, by the Commission. So again, we have a couple of slides uh, as well and some information which I would be very happy to to share with you, uh, but just uh, if you allow me to just pick up on the question to uh, Michaela, I think this is um, also precisely why we need a just transition fund that is targeted on uh, the technologies of the future, the renewable technologies, the electricity technologies, because there is so much innovation, so many opportunities uh, lying there, and that if we do not uh, use at uh, full speed all these great tools that we are developing, uh, we risk missing uh, nice opportunities. Thank you very much. Uh, has does any of the other panelists want to uh, comment on any of the the, the topics um, that we discussed? If yes, then uh, please just make your video on. Turn your video on. Okay, I I don't think so. Um, there is maybe one last question, Michaela, and this is to you uh, because I think it's good to leave uh, every sort of topic clarified. So this is again uh, related to the, the 50 billion that you mentioned. So the question is, is this the previous version of the JTM or you were talking about the recovery and resilience facility? Um, this was part of a form of, of uh, 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 an early draft of our recovery plan, I think this money was meant to be part of the res recovery resilience facility. But in the end, it wasn't earmarked. So you just have the big pot and member states allocations. I hope it clarifies. Okay, thank you very much. And perhaps we can uh, quickly address one last question. And this is about LCOE, the levelized cost of energy. So the question is, do you think that this is the best metric? And this is to Katrin, this is the best metric to use. Do you factor in the implications for the grid of variable renewables and the total system cost? Katrin? Yeah, um, it's a, sure, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and what in the LCOE analysis itself, we do not look at impacts on, on the grid or variability, but in the modeling, we do. So you know, the model understands that variable generation does require um, different needs from the system and that those usually will have some cost. Um, and so essentially the model is looking at an hourly basis on what options it has um, to, to deploy to meet uh, demand on an hourly basis. And in some cases, and more and more frequently, we're seeing that, you know, renewables plus whatever flexibility options the grid may need or may be already installed in the grid are a cheaper option than existing fossil assets or building new uh, fossil plants as well. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, I think we are really like one minute away from, uh, from the conclusion. So I just wanted to say big thanks to, first of all, to all participants, 200 people who uh, were able to give us 90 minutes of their life to, to listen to our conversation. Thank you so much. Mm, I want to thank also the DG Energy colleagues involved in the uh, Cold Region Transition Platform, Anna and Brio, who were uh, sort of uh, in the, in the, behind the, the doors here helping us um, run this, and also the Secretariat team, Elisa, Roberto, Natalia, Luke and Leila. Thank you. Thank you so much for making this work perfectly and making this possible. The last thing to do is to just invite you, and I hope, well, registration is closed, but many of you, I'm sure, registered for the last session of the uh, Cold Regions Virtual Week, which will be at 10.30 Brussels time tomorrow, and that will be on perspectives and insights from coal and pit regions. 
So with that, again, many thanks to all of you. Please uh, stay connected uh, with the, the platform and the initiative. Uh, download and share all the materials, and I we hope to see you very soon, uh, also in person uh, after after the the pandemic and the emergency is over. Thanks again, and have a great day.